Khalid, everything you said, I, I, I tend to agree with, particularly what you said at the beginning, because I just came today from London. And it cannot be overstated how Europe is tearing itself apart. Uh, this is a visceral, existential, uh, raging argument going on right across Europe. I, I showed you uh, yesterday's Daily Mail had a two-page spread of the fence and the headline, The Hordes, The Hordes Coming Through the, 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 the Fence. The uh, Calais camp was dismantled. Uh, part of it was dismantled yesterday. There was an incident in Germany of, uh, or a reported incident of two girls <laughs> assaulted uh, in a swimming pool by Afghans. This is all just fueling this, uh, this rage. As you were talking, it, it occurred to me, we've got a, millions of people fleeing dictatorships for democracies, and you're arguing that democracies are failing them. Can this be left to democracy to settle? Well, I, well, I mean, I, I, if you're asking about political systems, I don't think there's a much better option than democracy at the moment. But I think, as I, as I indicated towards the end of my rushed speech, and again, I'm, I'm sorry, I rushed it, but I wanted to make time for this conversation, governments alone are not coping. Uh, I think, frankly, some of our institutions, and I know IOM is represented here, and I'm a good friend of IOM, but some of our institutions are not coping. It seems to me, having been in Davos, and I know you were there too, John, that what we need is far more creative alliances. We need to find a way to bring in civil society, to bring in concerned and compassion, compassionate citizens, to bring in the private sector, to find new ways to deal with, again, what I think is not an insurmountable challenge. But you, you, just to reiterate what you've said, I live in Geneva, my home country, the UK. Europe is... I wouldn't go so far as to say yet falling apart, but teetering on the edge of falling apart over 1.5 million people. I mean, it, 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 it's bewildering. So you keep raising that number as if it's not uh, statistically significant. A million on a base of 500 million. I heard the same argument in London. It's, it's not the raw number. It's the intensity mm -hmm. of, of the flow. People do see, call them hordes, call them what you will. A million people it, call, coming all at once in a disorderly fashion. True, and again, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, particularly focused on cities and municipalities. Yes. I mean, you know, this is about certain regions in Germany and certain cities in Sweden and so on and so forth. And the UK is not really affected by it because the UK has been very restrictive about it. Um, but I spoke about perspective and I spoke about the numbers as part of the perspective and a global perspective. The other one is a historical perspective. Europe has been here in the recent past and dealt with it quite well. In the mid-1990s, when I started working in this area, over a million people fled the former Yugoslavia to the EU 15, as they were, and on the whole, with differences and with challenges, and of course, on the whole, the EU 15 absorbed that million or so people fairly well. They came in an uncontrolled manner, they were Muslim, and yet we coped. And here we are, the EU 28, apparently not willing. Right. It's not about ability, it's not about capacity, it's about political will. So what's, what's the difference them. now? It can't just be political will. Well, I mean, or I think recession matters. I think that, uh, you know, Europe is still undergoing the, the, the hangover of recession. We, we know from the research is fairly clear during times of recession, we don't like migrants. When we're wealthy, we don't mind migrants so much because they can drive our kids to school and clean our houses and so on mm. and so forth. There's always unfortunate correlation between the two. This coincides, I think, with a fairly visceral reaction towards Islam. The rise of ISIS, of course, doesn't help. As a British Muslim, I feel this very strongly. Um, it, there's just, I think Europe has changed, not the migration flow has changed. I think that's the difference. You, you, you've re referenced ISIS a couple of times as being um, a debatable factor in this. Many Europeans would say it is the factor. Mm -hmm. This is not just a refugee wave. This is an existential challenge to Western civilization, or at least it represents that. Uh, how do you address that concern among Europeans who feel that this is sort of the, the, uh, the, the tip of the spear, if you will, in terms of Look, I mean, it's clear a that challenge ISIS... to, to Europe and to European civilization. Yeah, I mean, it's clear that ISIS is part of the reason so many people are living in Syria. But, and by the way, not the only reason. I mean, you know, even refugee flight has mixed motivations. But clearly, ISIS and its activities are driving people away from Syria, as, by the way, is Russian bombing in Aleppo and so on and so forth. So there's more than just mm -hmm. ISIS taking place. But the notion, again, that ISIS is somehow infiltrating Europe with potential terrorists by putting people on boats, frankly, it seems plausible to me, but I've seen no evidence. And as I said, we have to be very careful about making any links between migration and security, and it's certainly not make assumptions where they're not yet proven. It, again, it seems to me, if I was ISIS, I would consider doing it. It would be a nice way to import some terrorists, but we've got no evidence about it at the moment. So this is, it's just a myth. There is no notion, there's no evidence that this is happening at the moment. 
Why, why is the rest of the world not doing more in terms of burden sharing or responsibility sharing? And you speak, speak about America, but also about the Middle East, about uh, Arab countries or other parts of the world. Well, on the one hand, I think I should you know, applaud and take my hat off to Canada. I think you reached your 25,000 resettlement limit today or, or recently. Compare that to the 20,000 that David Cameron has offered to settle over the next six years. And you begin to see perspective here. Um, before we get to the globe, let's look at Europe. Europe cannot agree how to resettle refugees. This is the kind of classic undergraduate exam question. You have 28 countries, you have a million people. How do you propose to divide these people between the countries? Do you do it on the basis of population? Do you do it on the basis of GDP? Do you do it on the basis of what? How do you do it? And of course, no one will agree because we're happy that Germany's taking the burden and they don't come to the UK. If you apply almost any equation or formula, lots of countries that don't want to be affected by this will, of course, become affected. And so if the EU can't find a way to share the so-called burden, it shouldn't surprise us that the rest of the world can't. The US, Canada, Australia, New Zealand are fulfilling their resettlement obligations, which I think is great. Uh, Sweden, Germany, of course, with its, with its gr grand statement of a million people, are resettling some people, but the Europeans aren't doing enough. But as I said at the beginning, proximity isn't the same as responsibility. I think Canadians could do more, frankly. I don't think 25,000 is enough. I think you could easily take more. I think you could do more to export the models that have worked in Canada about integration. As I say, <laughs> integration hasn't worked particularly well in Europe in the past, and I'm very concerned it's not going to work in the future. So there are things that I think Canadians can and should do. You shouldn't think that this is a European crisis and it has nothing to do with you. If Europe falls, you are going to lose a big trading partner. If what is happening in Europe continues, you can forget the 1951 Convention, you can forget the international legal underpinnings of what we have fought for the last 50 years to do to protect refugees. This is all, I think, at stake at the moment. In Europe, we're now seeing how, how, how many countries are essentially violating the Schengen Agreement. It's eight or ten now by having border, border controls. Yeah, I mean, France, free... France and Belgium, Austria, um, Switzerland, I think, has done yeah. it recently. I mean, you can, you, yes, yeah. So, so we have that going on. Angela Merkel, who was the great leader of Europe, is now politically imperiled, uh, may, well, may well lose, mm -hmm. and that, that every other leader in Europe is, is, is watching that. Is there any sign of hope <laughs> in Europe? Well, firstly, on Angela Merkel, I mean, I, I, I wrote a blog last year for the World Economic Forum that, where I, I seriously proposed Angela Merkel should be nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. What she did was, and of course she wasn't, um, I, I think she showed enormous courage in making the statement that she did. But let me also make this observation. I know lots of very senior German policymakers who hate her. Because it's one thing you standing up and making a grand statement, I'm the person who's got to deliver it. And delivery is very different from big political statements. So Angela Merkel showed political leadership, but perhaps not an understanding of policy challenges. So that's the, the Angela Merkel point. On prospects, again, I wrote a blog recently for, for the World Economic Forum about six months ago, where I suggested Europe might be at a tipping point. And I saw three reasons why Europe might be at a tipping point. One was I said that unlike any time I've seen before in Europe, People are now voting with their feet. You can build your fences, you can build your walls, we are coming. And look, this year alone, 160,000 people in the first 60 days, whatever it is. The second indication I saw of a tipping point was political leadership. This was just after Mrs. Merkel had made her statement. I hoped, as clearly she did, that other political leaders would follow suit, and obviously they haven't. The third thing I spoke about was compassion, a real feeling of compassion amongst European citizens. Six months on, when I look back at the analysis, it's all changed apart from the first. People are still voting with their feet and coming in large numbers. Political leadership has vanished, and I think Mrs. Merkel is imperiled. And frankly, I think the compassion is beginning to drain as well. Because as I've said, it's one thing being compassionate at the start, but when you begin to face the realities that migration is a challenge, that of course there's going to be Syrian kids in your kids' schools, that of course it might be a little bit more difficult to get the, onto the waiting list for health, that of course housing is going to become a bit more difficult. These are, of course, it's going to happen in Germany, and I think that's when compassion begins to drain. And so I'm afraid at the moment, I think the prospects are fairly gloomy. Mm. Uh, before we get to questions from the audience, I want to ask you two quick, uh, uh, quick questions about technology. Mm. Uh, you've blogged about the role or the, the prospects of IT, of uh, using IT to uh, reduce or confront, uh, con confront trafficking. It's, it's rather extraordinary that we're not seeing in this great age of, uh, of technology and uh, di digital access. We're not seeing better digital tools being used here. What, uh, what do you think could be done better? 
I mean, I think there, was, there is a lot of digitalization. You know, I've organized, I don't know if Jill's here, but organizations like IOM are certainly using really good technology to try to track migrants and find ways to resolve some of this stuff. But I think you're right, we could be much more creative in terms of using technology to find solutions. One thing we've been discussing at the World Economic Forum is a, is a project on mobile minds. Can we find a way to take advantage of the skills that some Syrians have in places like Turkey, for example, interpretation skills, without them having to pay smugglers and cross, boat, cross Mediterranean to get to Europe. Let's link them up virtually. Let's try to find ways to, to take advantage of their skills in a virtual way rather than endangering them. Uh, one of our, our council members is Western Union, and they're doing very strong work, I know, at the moment, in terms of trying to get access to social media for, for many refugees. And, and I've been told this story many times. When refugees from Syria arrive in Turkey, the first thing they ask for not water, not blankets. Where can I plug my mobile phone? Yeah. The first thing they ask. This is yeah. all about technology. Yeah. Typical, typical human question. Um, so on, on that note, this is the first refugee crisis, one might argue, of the social media age. Mm -hmm. How has social media been a factor? Has it been more positive or negative? I suppose I'm... It's an interesting question. Most of the social media I've seen is pretty positive. It's, it, it's trying to make the case that I am, that this can be positive, that this doesn't have to be crisis, that our government's perhaps not responding as positively as they should do. And perhaps if I'm right in that analysis, what this exposes is the weakness of social media, because I don't think the positive voice of social media has yet had an impact on the European debate. So that, that there's something about social media not yet impacting on politicians that I think we need to take seriously. Great. We've got a raft of uh, questions here. They're, they're, they're terrific, too. So first one on, on, the, on the private sector, the, and this is a fair critique. Uh, the private sector time frame is even briefer and more short term than government's elected terms. Why would we think the, priv the private sector would think long term? Um, well, the private sector does think long term. It's a, it's a more, I think it's a much more strategic outlook than governments do. And the evidence is clear. If, if you look at what's happening in Europe at the moment, and I'm sure some of these companies, RBC is probably one of them, companies are responding and filling in gaps. Companies are not just giving money, which is great, and that's something they should be uh, doing. And by the way, we didn't speak about the Middle East, and the yeah. Middle East is doing nothing to resettle refugees, yeah. and we might come back uh, to that. Companies are offering apprenticeships and trainings. Companies recognize that today's refugees, today's humanitarian challenge can be tomorrow's economic opportunity. And it's very clear. This is the first time I've seen it. The private sector is stepping up. I want them to step up more. I want people like Helena, I want your chairman to stand up publicly and say migration is good. Perhaps they do that in Canada, but they don't do it yet in, in our countries in Europe. A practical question here. What, what, what can be done at the local level to ensure the successful resettlement of refugees? The local level is a huge challenge. I gave the very quick anecdote of my friend who teaches in a school. I spoke about Malmo, where towards the end of last year, they, could, they could literally couldn't find enough beds for Syrians, and Syrians were sleeping in the streets. You can imagine how cold Malmo is in, in December. We've got to find ways to support local level initiatives. I don't think redistribution is the answer, and I think the Germans are, are trying to do this. On the whole, history shows that if you redistribute refugee populations around your country, they'll simply get on a bus and come back to the capital because that's where the jobs are, that's where their friends are, that's where their social networks are. So this really is about empowering the local level. It's something we discussed here today in last two years ago in Berlin. I've spoken about migration policy missing the private sector voice. It also absolutely misses the city voice. Migration is all about cities. You need mayors on your ta at the table, not just your national leaders. Here's a cheeky one. What, uh, what can Canada learn from Europe? <laughs> um, well, I mean, the easy answer is Canada can learn how not to do it. Um, <laughs> look, it's not all bad in Europe. I'm, and I, I, I'm, and I'm, I hope I haven't painted too gloomy a picture. I did say I thought the prospects were fairly gloomy at the moment. Lots of Europeans are reacting immensely positively. Now, I don't know Canada well enough. I know the Canadians are, on the whole, a fairly compassionate bunch. But, you know, you saw the stuff last year, people providing tents and bedrooms and places for people to sleep, people providing food, people signing up on social media to try to give blankets and food and so on and so, so forth to refugees, people driving across borders and moving people out of harm's way. The Europeans, I think, are responding positively. It's just that their governments are letting them down. So I think the Canadians can at least see some compassion amongst uh, Europeans. You've made a passionate argument about uh, the, the, the dividends from uh, uh, from encouraging large-scale migration. Are there academic studies to support your, uh, your argument? Sure. I, I mean, I, 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 I won't give out the reading list now, but I'm happy to give out the reading list. You know, I think the evidence is pretty incontrovertible. If well managed, and it's a big if, but if well managed, migration brings dividends. I mean, almost, almost full stop. There was, there was a, I mean, I can give you one. There was a good research that came out of University College London, my alma mater, for many years ago, that showed that 
migrants in the UK over the last 10 years have put £20 billion more into the economy than they've taken out of the economy. And let me just give you a quick... Mm. Uh, this is, I often reflect on this. This is something I, I do with students, but I can do it with a more educated and intelligent audience as well, not to be mean about students. <laughs> <laughs> many, many, of you are, many of you will be parents, and many of you will, will have been to this. You're, you're sitting at home with a small cake and four children, and your children are saying, do not invite somebody else, because then we have to divide this cake into five pieces, and I want my quarter. Of course, when you invite that somebody else, his or her mother or father brings another cake and there's more cake to go around. This is what migrants do. We, the economy isn't a fixed thing that we have to slice up into more and more pieces. The economy grows as migration grows. So I'd like to write a book or a blog called Let the Migrants Bring Cake, because they do bring cake. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's good. Let's... So this may lead into the, uh, the point you were making about uh, Arab nations. Uh, should traditional host countries like the US and Australia make a stronger case uh, to non-traditional hosts like China or Japan? And we can well, throw in uh, several could... Middle East countries to that. Yes. Um, I mean, what the Middle East is doing is, is, in its opinion, sharing, shouldering its part of the burden with money. And there's no doubt at all that Qatar and the UAE and Saudi Arabia are putting in large amounts of money to try to support some of these camps in Turkey and Jordan and Lebanon. The question is, is money sufficient? I don't think so. I mean, there's, there's some quite interesting research. You know, should we have a kind of almost equivalent of a carbon trading deal where I, the UK doesn't want lots of refugees, but we'll pay X per head of refugee for Germany to keep them? I mean, you don't want to dehumanise refugees and start trading them in that way, but these are the sorts of innovative answers that we need to get out there. As I said, e, the EU doesn't know how to redistribute or share this so-called burden and the rest of the world doesn't. I think Japan, I mean, if you want to look at a country with a demographic crisis, it's Japan, but mm. as we know, they're pretty reluctant to bring in even diaspora Japanese, let alone Koreans, let alone people from strange places like Syria. I think China could do more. I think absolutely the Middle East, the, the, the Muslim brothers could do much more about, not the Muslim Brotherhood, the Muslim <laughs> brothers mm. could do much more about this and frankly aren't. So yes, I think not just the US and Australia, but Europe too should be looking to other places in the world to, to share this challenge. Why is the UN not doing more to bring these conversations to the fore and even f force those decisions by its members? The UN is, well, I mean, the UN will be hosting a big summit, I think it's on the 19th of September around the General Assembly on migration. Of course, by that Jeez. time, there'll have been another 3,000 people drowned in the Mediterranean. One could be quite cynical about yeah. this. I think the UN and, and many of our institutions uh, have been outpaced and outgrown by this challenge. I think, you know, we're trying to apply the 1951 convention to a population that no longer fits that convention. We are trying to firefight rather than being proactive. And on the proactivity, I think there are two things we should be doing much more of. We should be looking upstream. Let's find ways to let people live safely if they can in Syria. Let's make conditions bearable in Turkey and Jordan and Lebanon so people don't have to pay smugglers to cross, uh, to cross the Mediterranean. And again, let's look downstream and make sure we focus on focus on the integration, which we're not at the moment. The UN is failing. In my are, 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 the, the UN is failing? Yeah. Yeah. On, on this, yes. yes. Yeah. Are, are you suggesting uh, building camps within Syria? And it's even moving in, w having military incursions to create safe zones? We've seen that in previous uh, um, decades. As you say, we've seen it in previous decades. It, it's, it's not without controversy, but it mm. has been done, and it has been done fairly effectively. De providing some sort of safety, temporary haven, no-fly no zones, this stuff is conceivable, although I recognise the Syrian conflict is very difficult indeed. Um, finding better ways to protect internally displaced persons. And as you know, there are many IDPs in the world, many more than refugees, who basically have no legal rights at all. There's no framework to protect or assist them. We could think about strengthening that. Uh, I think getting more money into local Syrian NGOs who are trying to make a difference but simply can't because of a lack of funding. I, I, I think it is beyond me and beyond us, and I fear beyond the world to solve the Syrian crisis, but we can find pockets of hope within Syria, and I think we should be doing that. Uh, we've been given a bit of an extension on our time, Great. by the way. So Good. Have, have a sip of water. Uh, <laughs> with, with increasing signs of uh, global recession, how can fragile economies uh, continually absorb more refugees? Um, I'm not sure many fragile economies, at least in Europe, are, because Europe is certainly not fragile. Again, the, the wealthiest single state in the world. The fragile economies you should be concerned about are, the, again, Pakistan, Turkey, Kenya, this is where the heat is, this is where the challenge is, and again and again and again these countries have shown themselves to be hospitable. Now you can criticise Pakistan and Iran, and you should, these are pretty dodgy countries at times, but between them they have had 5 million Afghan refugees mm -hmm. for the last 30 years. David Cameron wants to take 20,000 Syrians over the next six years. 
So the fragile states have shown that it's possible. It's not easy. There are all sorts of challenges in, in eastern Iran and in northwest Pakistan. But on the whole, that, that sense of openness, that sense of hospitality has persisted. But let me make one point. We are, I think we've lost it. And if we haven't lost it, we're very close to losing any sense of moral high ground here. You know, don't go to Pakistan and tell them what to do when you're doing this in Europe. Any notion that we can now preach or convey what's right or, or in any way say that we are representing or we stand for a principled moral approach, I think is fading fairly quickly. Speaking of morals, how long can we continue to focus uh, so intensively on one refugee crisis and ignore so many others? That, that's a very good question. As I, as I said very quickly, and I, I whizzed mm -hmm. through it, this isn't just about Syrians. You know, the, the top number of asylum seekers in Europe are core Syrians. We also have many Afghans, Eritreans, a large number, Kosovo, Albania, most of them, frankly, not refugees, but using the asylum system, which is another uh, question altogether. Uh, the numbers, I think, will continue to increase. We are wrong to focus just on Syrians. I think the Syrians are capturing our imagination, as they should. This is an incredible conflict, I think a generational conflict, once in a generation, creating, and it, you know, one in, one, in three, one in three Syrians has left their home. One in three Syrians has left their home, either internally or internationally. This is the destruction of a country. And forget rebuilding the country if you don't get them back. But yes, let's not take our eye off the other refugee populations. And John, you were there with me as well in Davos. Davos was wonderful. The World Economic Forum put this stuff on the agenda, which they haven't done before. But in Davos, migration was synonymous with Syrian refugees. There is a much bigger story out there about migration. 240 million people, talents, human rights abuses. There's much more going on. Don't forget that stuff as well. Isn't this also about something much bigger, which is the remaking of the Middle East? Perhaps even the d dismantling of the Middle East, as uh, we have known it, Syria is is uh, eroding or fading as a, as, a, as a nation state. Some wonder if Saudi Arabia is, is next and how many millions more will, will, uh, will move to Europe? I mean, Europe should be concerned about this. And if you add instability, not but, just... And that's part of the European fear is that uh, you know, there's no end to this, so let's build the fence, the wall, whatever. The fence won't work. There's no way the to flotilla. make it. The fences simply won't work. I mean, by the way, one, one explanation which may be true for the huge surge in numbers at the beginning of this year is that migrants know that walls are being built and they want to get in before the walls are built. Mm. But generally, history demonstrates that walls will not keep people out. They will tear them down, they'll pay smugglers, they'll die in the sea, they will find a way. We recently interviewed a thousand Syrians in Turkey and Greece, and something like 93% Greece, the European Union country Greece, and 93% of them said, we are moving onwards. And you won't be able to do much to stop it, and certainly not by building walls. The Middle East is fragile. More distant countries are no longer distant. You can pay a smuggler $5,000 to get from Kenya yeah. to the UK. Rising middle classes, $5,000 is now within your reach. I've seen smugglers do the sales pitch. You can do this, ladies and gentlemen. Just borrow, just beg, just steal. You can do it. This is within your reach. So it, further distant, fragile states are, I think, a challenge. Climate change is coming. That's likely to drive more people around the world. I don't think to Europe, but around the world. And don't forget demography. Yes. The, yeah. the, the, I mean, it varies across countries, but in Europe today, the fertility rate is something like 1.7, 1.8, not the 2.1 replacement rate. In North Africa, it's something like 6.1. You know, North Africa, in the next 50 years, needs to absorb another 100 million people into its labor market. Today, unemployment in North Africa is running at 40%. You tell me how they're going to do that. Yep. They can, this is going to drive migration. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that is the epic challenge, Absolutely. or the challenge of the century. Yep. Uh, and, and it's not just North Africa, the Middle East. Mm -hmm fastest growing region in, uh, I think, population-wise yep. in, in, in the world now. Yep. Uh, a media question. Uh, someone agrees that uh, a responsible media is essential to have a good and responsible conversation on this issue. How does one uh, do that <laughs> while respecting freedom of the press? I, I heard that you were the editor-in-chief of the Global Mail, and I'm very pleased I said the Global Mail was a good newspaper. I didn't really <laughs> <laughs> Very it good newspaper. Very, so perhaps you should answer that question, but let me just give you an anecdote and an answer. I had a similar debate a, a few years ago on a different not the Syrians, with the BBC, and the moderator, who was a BBC journalist, when I said what we need is more responsible media, literally put his hand on my knee and said, good luck with that, mate, because that's not coming anytime soon. I, I can't see any hope amongst the media. I think the answer is, by the way, employ more migrants in the media. If yeah. you want to get a perspective from migrants, get them in as interns, get the Syrians in interning in the Globe and Mail, and maybe they'll 
give you some education about what this is all about. That may be one answer, but it's a long way away. You showed me before mm. we started, the middle pages of Daily Mail, the hordes are coming, build the fences. You know, we're one fence away from millions of these people arriving. This is the stuff that we've got to deal with. Yeah, there's a, there's a terrific reporter at the Globe who was a, a, a Vietnamese boat, uh, boat kid. He came yeah. over as a, a child and he was always fantastic when, yeah. when we'd have newsroom debates on this because he spoke from personal sure. experience and, 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 and was so knowledgeable about what was going on in the community. Uh, I was in a different conversation today about coverage of uh, health scares. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we had a SARS crisis here more than a decade ago, uh, there was a concerted effort by the chief health officer to talk to the media mm -hmm. about, about coverage. And the media at the time was open to that. Yep. It seemed like a reasonable conversation. Why can't that happen on a, a uh, socioeconomic issue like this? It's a, it's a very good point. And I often make this case that you know, migration can learn lessons from other areas of public policy. We've had nuclear disasters, places like Japan, where we've managed to rebuild public confidence by educating, by speaking, by negotiating with the media. We've had health crisis. We had the mad cow disease, so-called, in the UK, and we rebuilt confidence and people are now eating British beef. We just can't do it with migration. And I think migration needs to look beyond its narrow focus to learn lessons from these other fields as well. It's a terrific one about, uh, is, is, isn't there the need for a complete overhaul of our international migration and refugee regime? Yes. <laughs> Next. Well, I, but let me tell you, yeah. well, let, I mean, I'll, let me give you the, you know, I'm not going to give you the lecture, but let me tell you why it's so challenging. We have a 1951 convention written in a specific historical and geographical context, post-World War II uh, Europe. Uh, it was only supposed to last for three years. We were supposed to deal with that challenge and then it was gone. Of course, now we have all sorts of new challenges. We are applying a convention written 60, whatever it is, four years ago to a completely new landscape where clearly it doesn't apply. The problem is, if you open up the 51 convention for negotiation, guess what will happen? We'll negotiate downwards, not upwards. If you think 170 states are going to ratify a more generous convention today, forget about it. That's why we're not going to touch it. And we just have to find a way to make it work. I've got a question here on uh, essentially selectivity. Uh, countries uh, focusing on migrant family units versus individuals. Uh, and you've been very nice to Canada. We've actually been very selective. No, uh, no men, essentially. <laughs> um, this relates to the, the question you just asked about the international system. And I think, and this is going to be controversial, but I think we are coming to a point where we need innovation and we need to think differently about these challenges. Now, there's been a, for very good reasons indeed, a very clear distinction always drawn between humanitarianism and national interests. You know, we, refugees are people who need protection and assistance. It's not about their, their talents or what they can give me as an economy, it's about their needs as people in, in need of protection and assistance. I think we're going to have to start discussing where that line moves. I think we're going to have to start discussing whether we can reconcile national interests with bringing in refugees. I think some of the resettlement countries are doing that. I think it's a holy cow that's going to have to be put down and slaughtered. We have to have these discussions. We have to think about whether all refugees need protection. We have to think about whether refugee status, which basically is permanent once you get to Canada and Europe, should be permanent, or whether we have the right to return refugees once they're countries. These are really big, really emotional, really difficult questions. But what is clear is we are running out of solutions for refugees. We're not integrating them locally. They're not going home, and they're certainly not being resettled in any significant numbers at the moment. But is selectivity okay if it allows nations to, or nation states to uh, accept large numbers? I think so, yeah. So that's the price that Canada had to pay yeah. essentially to get to the 25,000. We had to be very, very uh, selective. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, you know, policy is all about trade-offs and I think it's a trade-off that has to be made. I'm not, I'm not a purist. I, I suspect if a colleague from UNHCR was here, they'd argue very differently, but I think you just have to recognize the, the, the trade-offs. And I'd rather 25,000 people all be selected than none or than 5,000 certainly better than 20,000 in six years. Yeah. How, how, how do you feel about family reunification, uh, probably in, in, in favor of it, but how, how do you see that being managed in the, uh, in the years ahead once and if things settle down? Well, of course, this is the great fear, isn't it, that you know, you're not importing one Syrian, you're importing six Syrians, because he will have a wife and five yeah. kids who will then get the right wife and four kids, six, who will have the right to come and join them. Family, family reunification has to continue. It's a basic human right. It's part of the 48 declaration on human rights, but it's another one of those holy cows we're just going to have to start looking at. If, if the only way to sell to name your government is that we're going to bring people in in large numbers and for a certain period of time, they can't be joined by the family. These are difficult issues and I think we have to have the discussion. Just as an aside, an interesting, I just got an 
today a submission for the Journal of Refugee Studies that I, that I edit, and I don't know if we'll take, take it forward, but a really interesting article about people from Bhutan being resettled to the US, and in Bhutan they practice polygamy, and so this particular person had four wives, and God knows how many children, and the US has said, you've got to choose one. <laughs> Family reunification Jeez. does not extend to your polygamous. So this is a great clash of kind of Western norms with, with other cultures, and how you resolve that sort of stuff is very interesting. You know, Donald Trump could turn that into a game show. <laughs> he could, absolutely. It's, uh, sorry, that shouldn't be recorded. That, uh, that'll be taken seriously in some places. <laughs> you, you've kind of touched on this, but it's, it, this is asked, asked so directly, it's worth, uh, it's, it's, it's worth uh, putting it to you. Is there a more radical solution to the migrant crisis than, uh, that you would want to see tested? Well, I think we could, you know, I, I think if you ask me to summarize the hallmarks of the European response today, it would be about reaction, it would be about being negative, it would be about being individual. I think all of that can change. I think we can be more proactive, I think we can be much more open in terms of partnership, and I think we can be much more positive. We've just got to shift the needle from negative to positive. I think we can be doing more work upstream, as I said. And again, these, these are difficult, controversial issues. I think it is possible to think about ways to give people some way of surviving in some form of dignity within Syria, some people. I think we can do more to try to make life more bearable and sustainable in places like Turkey and Jordan and Lebanon. And we have to accept that some people will have to move on, but it shouldn't be the 93% of people we interviewed that they all want to move on. Now, the, Tur the European Union has just pledged $3 billion, 3 billion euros, I guess, uh, to Turkey to try to anchor people is the term they're using. That sounds a lot like paying someone to take your problem off your hands, but I think there are ways we should be thinking more innovatively about this. Is Turkey doing enough? I think Turkey is doing the best it can. It's a country that's under all sorts of crises. Um, I think 2.7 million refugees at the moment. For the longest time, Turkey kept its border open, and I think it should be absolutely applauded for that. It's now closing its border. It's now making the case that we've, we can't take any more, and I kind of sympathize with that argument. What, what effect do you think that will have over the next couple of years? I think, that, I think, that, I suspect what will happen is that the European Union will make every effort to keep that border open. Because if that border closes and there is some threat of genocide or some really mm. tragic outcome in Syria, that will be blood on our hands and that's basically unacceptable. So I think there'll be a lot of pressure on Turkey to keep the border open. And then there'll be interesting discussions about EU membership and what the payoff is. And th there could be some interesting geopolitical games to play out. Yeah, I think we're uh, about to wrap up, but there's one question I've been saving uh, for, for the end, and that is uh, if you could put three people <laughs> in the world in a room together to solve the current crisis, who would they be? Um, Angela Merkel, <laughs> um, the chairman or woman of, of Royal Bank of Canada, and <laughs> I've got to, I've got to, and Ratner. There and Ratner. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's terrific. It's been a, a, a delight and uh, very enriching, en enriching to, to listen to you and I'm sure lots more, lots more questions. But thank you. Thank you.